It's said that we know more about the surface of Mars than our oceans. This is certainly true with the Kimberley, Western Australia, our last great marine wilderness. Three times the size of Victoria, this magnificent untouched area has escaped human exploitation for the last two and a half million years. It boasts a truly unique and unspoiled ecosystem, unexplored and unknown to science. But today, this pristine area faces massive pressures to exploit its lucrative energy and mineral resources, as well as to further develop its tourism and fishing industries. This incredible wilderness is also not immune to the damaging effects of climate change. Sensing an urgent need to understand the ecological value of its diverse marine environment, the Western Australian Marine Science Institution, or WAMSI, has assembled a small team of dedicated scientists in an attempt to unlock some of its mysteries before it's too late. Join us as we uncover the secrets that lie under Kimberley waters. In an area this vast, it is vital that the team decides which specific region they'll focus their research on. Lead scientist Dr. Steve Blake decides to conduct an aerial survey. We decided that this area was effectively a virgin field area for, from a scientific perspective. and We felt that uh, it had no or very little information uh, collected to date, so it was a really great opportunity for us to build a regional marine science program in this region. It's sorely lacking, and yet this is a vital area for uh, the future of Australia in terms of energy resources, uh, notwithstanding the great wilderness and other environmental values of this coastline. Having said that, the Kimberley is a massive area. There's over 3,000 islands, 13,500 kilometres of coastline. You can't do it all. You couldn't do it all in four lifetimes. So we're just picking this part of, I guess, the Kimberley from Camden Sound down to Collier Bay, including Montgomery Reef. And um, we're just focusing there in 2008. The WAMC team has arrived in Broome to begin their exploration of the region. To get to their location, Pearl Sea Coastal Cruisers have provided their research vessel, the Kimberley Quest. It'll take the scientists over 12 hours by boat, covering a distance of over 200 nautical miles. Uh, Kimberley Quest, this is uh, Coach Thanks for getting back to us this morning. Uh, we're conducting whale surveys, uh, ocean geographic research up here for the next week. Thanks very much for those details. Uh, you have a nice time down there. The weather looks pretty good. Yeah. The Wamsey scientists are not the only ones who have arrived in the Kimberley coastal waters. This is a female Group 4 humpback whale and her newly born calf. It is believed that these whales carry their unborn calves along an ancient route beginning in Antarctica. The indigenous people from this country have passed down stories of whales returning to a secret birthing place somewhere here in the Kimberley. Our dreamtime stories have songs about the whales. Our people still sing these songs today relating to those sites and animals from that land in that area. Today, large numbers of whales have been spotted by the tourist operators and the few naturalists that can reach this remote region. The scientists hope to determine if these stories are predictable 
and learn as much as they can about this mysterious marine environment. Okay, the infamous whales, the majority of the whales, well, they're all in this area, but certainly in this area around here, um, this is where most of the, the mothers and calves are basically at the moment. So it's a really, you should see a lot of whales on, on this trip. Opportunistically, my, my suggestion is if we see whales congregating along a front, an oceanographic front, and obviously there's something going on, unlike the last trips where we've just kept going steaming, doing whale observing, my suggestion on this trip will be to um, actually do some detailed sampling across some of these oceanographic fronts, biological, physical, chemical, and um, get the whale behavioural stuff, because these, these whales are feeding along some of these, these fronts. In this series of expeditions, the scientists will study the currents and tides, the physical properties of the water column and its biology. They'll map the sea floor and from the air link hyperspectral data with information measured at sea. They'll collect samples floating on the surface and from the very bottom of the ocean. Along the way, they'll observe wildlife behaviour and record life underwater. This way, they will end up with a holistic overview of the entire system. Important information, if we are to understand just how valuable and diverse this amazing region is. There, just there. It's just coming As up the now. team near just their destination, a pot of whales there. passes by. Now, no one has any doubts about just how important this area is for the humpback whales. Well, just on this site, we just saw about uh, two or three humpback whales around this area where we collected this water. And um, we think that, you know, phytoplankton is a small scale of what humpback whales may be consuming. So I guess if there's a high productive area, then it might mean that the humpbacks might be coming to that area to feed. So this is a, um, a phytoplam, which is a phytoplankton analyzer. It's measuring, if you like, the energy activity of the phytoplankton cells. So then you can relate this to primary production. Um, so we can find out, you know, productivity measurements and, and relate it um, possibly in the future when other measurements are taken in comparison to this. And we'll also be taking CTD profiling, conductivity, temperature and depth. Uh, the oceanographers will be lowering the instrument down to the sea floor and back up and recording conductivity, temperature and depth um, every second or so uh, as it goes through the water column and back up. It appears that these great creatures are just as curious about us as we are about them. Here he comes! Unlike other tropical regions, the Kimberley Reefs have never been polluted by agricultural runoff, dredging or impacted by human activity. To date, no known species have become extinct here, making it an important area, not just for Australia, but for the international scientific community too. The scientists know that mapping these reefs and documenting the diversity of life forms is essential for future study and conservation. In such an abundant and diverse ecosystem, Dangerous predators are very much part of life here, so to see what lies below the surface can be very risky. For this reason, Graham has built a drop camera to record the vast underwater reefs safely and efficiently. Okay, we've got a 1024. Graham, I'll get you to just put it down just a touch. You got any cod on that? No, nothing. Can you mark on the log sheet under remarks? That was, that's where we're really picking up the first sort of signs of sponges and uh, sea whips and things. This gets very exciting. Right. Did you make a note of that depth, uh, Maddie? That, yeah, 7.7. That was the first yeah. uh, acropora. Oh, we got coral down here. We got coral. Okay. <clears throat> down. Down. Oh yes. Oh yes. We are serious coral reef now, guys. We're going through. <laughs> we're going through a load of fish. To record the diversity of fish life, the scientists deploy a baited video system. It doesn't take long before they get a feeding frenzy. Oh, 
A big shark just went past. What? Yeah, we've got a shark. Had the drop camera in the water and uh, we found some nice corals over at um, Wilson Point and we've got a nice transect of uh, both corals and uh, filter feeding communities. So if the boys here can um, get the equipment back up and running, we should be able to repeat the transect and get some better data this time. I tell you what, absolutely brilliant. Two months ago, oceanographers from the University of Western Australia deployed three tide gauges. It's up to the WAMPSI team to retrieve them to collect the critical data. The tide progresses through the whole Camden Sound region. It doesn't just all arrive in one point at the same time in terms of the, the uh, progression of the tide through the bay. So what we're trying to do is actually, with the three tide gauges, have a look at basically the time lag or the time delay as the uh, tide comes in and the tide goes out throughout the whole of the region. Hence why there's three loggers and they're, they're quite spaced apart. Nowhere is evidence of the massive tides more clearly demonstrated than the nearby cliffs. So what we have here, of course, is the uh, exposed cliff face of this island. Um, you can see the uh, sort of limpets and mussels. Um, we're on low tide here, but look right up to the, uh, to the white line there. That's effectively the high tide area. And you can see it's a very, very large tidal range, up to 11 metres in this part of the world. So two highs a day, two lows a day, that's called a semi diurnal tidal variation. And it basically drives all of the, I think, most of the um, biodiversity of this whole region is these intense tidal currents. To escape the extreme tidal currents, a humpback whale and her calf have found shelter behind one of the numerous islands. Like humans, humpback whales breathe air. This calf is learning to manoeuvre at the surface in order to take a breath. His mother stays very close, supporting him from underneath as he learns these skills. Like mammals everywhere, they've developed a close bond. The same conditions that make these bays safe havens for this mother and calf present dangers for the Wamsi team and their skipper. There's quite a few dangers associated with working in the Kimberley. Pretty much majority of the Kimberley is not really surveyed that well. This grey area here is pretty much is a grey area. There's um, no surveying um, as far as bottom detail goes, like reefs, rocks. Um, or depths. The, um, the chart says that there's about eight metres of water and uh, you know, there's a bit of a six metre bank here but all that dries out on a low spring tide to, to a, um, be a pretty big reef. So without having local knowledge and not knowing that you could end up in quite a bit of trouble. The challenge arrives the next day. You know, I've made a request to the skipper to anchor close to this reef. We're just doing this for the first time. See if the, the corals are different from perhaps those down further south around the islands. He might, at the end of half an hour of trying, say to me, no go mate, we're, we're, it's too hazardous, it's too risky. And I accept that call because um, these are uncharted waters up here, it's incredible. So again, we may not get this, but I'd love to get to see the uh, coral life on some of these more exposed reefs. The team arrives at the new pristine reef and look for the best spot to explore. Just out and around actually. We don't want to get stranded here. Unexpectedly, they meet up with a large Ooh, sea snake. There are around 55 species of sea snakes found in the world today. Of this, around 22 are found here off the coast of Western Australia. That is mad. That's a biggie, that one. As well as the drop camera, Graham has provided a remote operated vehicle, a compact video system that can record marine life between the coral branches. Yeah, we just need to be in slightly deeper water. Oh, look at that coral. As with any technology, in the field it can become overwhelmed by the tough conditions. 
Water. Hold on, hold on, I can't see a thing. But I've got nothing on the screen. Now one motor's um, took a bit of damage when we were in the coral. Um, so I'm just testing it now. And then I'll change the motor. It looks like it's going to be a big job to get the ROV up and working again. In such virgin territory, there is a huge range of vital information that can be gathered, including the topography of the sea floor. Okay, we're in the program. This is called uh, Max C, a uh, plotting program that we use aboard the Browse Express. Um, it, it maps uh, the bottom in a 3D image by using the transducer from uh, this echo sounder here and it, it paints a picture of the bottom in yeah, 3D image. Now the cockle reefs has a, a narrow channel that we um, navigated through so you can see where it's 30 metres deep, 25-30 metres deep and it steps up to about 15-10 metres in the middle of the channel before dropping down to about 20 metres on the other side of it, on the southern side of it. It is 3 a.m. and Graham has spent the last couple of days repairing the ROV. He needs to get it working before they reach a vital marine habitat, Montgomery Reef. What about the tide gauge? I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I tell you what I'm nervous about, that tide gauge north of Champagne Island. The one at Cockle Reef, I reckon be right, but the one at Champagne it's really out there. is too many trawlers and stuff. I, I think we we'll, might have lost it. What we're going to have to do is probably you and the skipper will just have to tic-tac with radio just to make sure that we head in the right direction. If you've got a handheld, that'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Find it okay, away. good. All right, we have. You've got a we have, we have. The scientists have arrived at the site where the second tide gauge was deployed. The tide is rapidly going out, and at low tide it will be too dangerous to navigate through the reef. That leaves them a safety margin of only 30 minutes to locate the gauge and move out to deeper waters. Is this where it's supposed to be? Well, we're pretty much on the money right here, eh? So what we're doing now is we're looking for the second tide gauge. It was put out two months ago. It's a very exposed spot, um, so we're looking for the buoy. We're coming on the previous GPS fix from before, and uh, as yet we've not found it. So we uh, have to keep uh, looking around here and see if we can pick it up. With time rapidly running out, the team is getting anxious. The ocean suddenly looks very big. <laughs> Yeah, there is something. There is something. There is. No, no, there's oh, an animal. Turtle. 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 Yeah, it's a turtle. Oh. Just, just, just yeah. away. Despite an extensive search, it appears that the strong tides and harsh conditions have taken the gauge and all of its information with it. This is very disappointing for the all team. All right, George, take us home. It was a more exposed spot than we thought we put it. Like I thought that's where we put it in there, yeah. It just seems so exposed out there. 